Uh, yeah, just uh, uh, um, I want to present uh, Tim. Uh, Tim uh, now is a senior lecturer at Cardiff University. Uh, he graduated in 2011 from the University of Oxford in astrophysics. And then from 2011 to 2014, he was an ESO fellow in Garching. That, that's where we met. Uh, uh, I have to say that he was a, a, an example to many of us because he always had many interesting results to, to show. Then in 2014, he uh, 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 took an Ernest uh, Rutherford fellowship and he took it to Hertfordshire, which I understand is called usually only Hertz. And he was there for a year. And then uh, he uh, was uh, four years in Cardiff uh, uh, as a lecturer, and now he, uh, he's a senior lecturer. So uh, he will give a talk on, on, on molecular, uh, uh, using molecular lines uh, to study galaxy evolution. So let's uh, thank, uh, let's thank uh, Tim, please. Thank you very much, Roberto. Uh, thank you all for uh, inviting me to give the talk. Uh, it's, it's great to uh, have the chance to chat with you. Um, so as Roberto said, my talk is going to concentrate on how we can use the cold molecular gas in galaxies to tell us about their evolution. So I'm going to start very broad and then sort of narrow down. Hopefully the talk is going to be, you know, half an hour-ish. So I've actually removed one of the results I mentioned in the abstract just to uh, make sure we could run for a sensible amount of time. But feel free to ask me questions on other things as and, as and when they come up. So, um, how do I change slides in this video? <laughs> okay, I can do that. So, uh, for those of you who aren't galaxy evolution people, um, what we know when we look around us in the universe is that galaxies come in many shapes and sizes. So we've got beautiful spiral galaxies like this example here, uh, and like our own Milky Way galaxy, of course, uh, that are forming lots of stars. Uh, they tend to be disky, they're rotating. Um, but this isn't the only type of galaxy in the universe, far from it. Uh, you have other types of things. You have lenticulars like this one here, where you still have a bit of a disk, but you have a big, big bulge component where the stars have been, their orbits have been heated, and they have a large bulge component. And then taking this to its logical extreme, you have galaxies where they have no disk at all. They're just balls of stars uh, called elliptical galaxies. And uh, so these are the main types of giant galaxies that we see around us uh, in the universe. And these structures um, are used to classify the objects, but they also link to their formation pathways and their evolution pathways. So the classical way of doing this uh, cla the, the classification of galaxies is through things like the Hubble tuning fork, which you've all seen many times, uh, where you group together the galaxies that are elliptical and lenticular as early type galaxies. Um, originally, this was proposed as actually an evolutionary name, but these were the things that formed first and then things evolved to the late type galaxies, which are the spirals that are on the right hand side of my diagram here. But uh, Actually, it turned out that that wasn't the case. Um, you know, Hubble himself was very keen that people didn't interpret it this way. Some people did for a while, but uh, that, that's more or less what well, has died out now because we've realized it's probably actually the other way around. So galaxies in the early universe have a lot of gas and that gas collapses to a disk through conservation of angular momentum. So you end up with disk galaxies first and through hierarchical formation in the Lambda CDM framework, if you smash together these spiral galaxies, uh, then you can get the galaxies on the left-hand side that have this more heated stellar population that forms a bulge. So these structures clearly then have an imprint of the galaxy's evolutionary history. The things that are spirals at the current day can't have experienced many of these, many of these giant galaxy smash-ups and galaxy mergers. Um, and indeed, but the ones that are early types on the left-hand side of this diagram, they likely have, they've likely had a much more um, violent history. So that, that's fairly well understood. There's still lots of open questions about how you, how you change these objects from one to the other. Um, but what I'm gonna concentrate on in this talk is about how the structures the galaxies have at the present day, how those can actually affect the future evolution of these systems. And I'm gonna use a tool to do that. Um, and I'm gonna try and answer 
well, uh, in the original talk is three, but today I'm going to concentrate mainly on two questions, which is about black holes and why they care about the galaxy that they live in, because it seems that they do, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. And then about molecular clouds and star formation, because I'm going to show you some evidence that they also care about the type of galaxy they live in. And, and why is quite subtle and it's quite interesting, the physics uh, that's underpinning the ISM and star formation in those objects. So I'll, I'll try and concentrate on that today in the time we have. So to do that, I'm going to use uh, the interstellar medium as my tool of choice. Um, and primarily here, the, inter the molecular interstellar medium. Uh, and the reason I want to do that for the second question is kind of obvious. So the molecular gas is the fuel for star formation. Uh, it's the cold material, 10 to 50 Kelvin. I know a lot of you study this material as well, um, where the gas is primarily molecular. And this is the fuel for, for star formation, the direct fuel. Um, so the second question is obvious that this is the material that you want to probe if you want to understand why star formation in galaxies cares about the galaxy it lives in. Uh, but it's also a really nice tool to probe black holes, it turns out. And the reason for that is it's a great dynamical tracer. At these sort of temperatures here, there isn't much pressure support for this gas. So it pretty much is a dynamically cold tracer, in most objects at least, that traces the underlying potential of the galaxy. And that is quite powerful when you want to study and estimate the masses of supermassive black holes. Um, so I'm going to move to talk about the black holes now. So as you're probably all aware, AGN, uh, active galactic nuclei, where material is accreted to a black hole and the energy liberated uh, is quite significant in that sort of process. And it's thought that that energy release is really important in changing galaxies from the spiral type, the star forming type objects into the more quiescent early type galaxies, the ellipticals and lenticulars that I mentioned earlier. So uh, for instance, uh, as, you, as you're all, all aware, I suspect, um, if you look at the spiral galaxies and the early type galaxies on a color magnitude diagram, for instance, so uh, you have a color, uh, U minus B in this instance in the, the bottom figure here, um, against the mass of the galaxy or its magnitude equally, um, you see that galaxies form these, this blue cloud of blue objects, and that's mostly where the star forming galaxies live, and this red sequence where the early type galaxies live. Um, and there's a lack of galaxies in between. And that's one of the pieces of evidence that people have used to suggest you can't move things from the spiral type galaxies. You can't just let them use up their ISM uh, because you've not refueled it and let them slowly evolve to become redder as their blue stars die. Because then you'd fill in this gap between the two populations. If you want to preserve the gap, you have to have something that acts really quite fast. Um, so within a gig year or so, you need to get rid of all the ISM in your galaxy and quench it with a, you know, a hard stop. And so there are various ways to do that. So in dense environments, for instance, you can do that for, through environmental processes. But for field galaxies, uh, and for the most massive galaxies indeed, uh, that, that isn't the only process that must be happening. We also think that the black holes in galaxies must be involved. They help us solve this problem and a range of other problems, maybe the galaxy mass functions and all sorts of things. There's a lot of evidence, especially from the theoretical side of things, that the energy liberated by accretion onto supermassive black holes is very important in galaxy evolution in quenching these objects. But while that is the case, um, it's not exactly clear observationally how that happens why it happens, which comes first, well, this is a chicken and an egg problem. So one of the lines of evidence that suggests that indeed galaxies and their black holes uh, feed back onto each other comes from this, which is the black hole uh, galaxy property relations. So here I'm showing you, for instance, the black hole mass of a galaxy on the y-axis plotted against the stellar velocity dispersion. So that's essentially a measure of the mass of the galaxy that we're looking at here. Uh, for a variety of galaxies. So this is a large compilation. There's something like 90 measurements here of black hole masses. And you can see that they correlate quite well 
this large scale property of the galaxy, it's, its total mass essentially, and the black hole mass. And that's weird because black holes, although they're supermassive in this case, they're actually tiny objects, right? They're, if you've got a galaxy of 10 to the 11 solar masses, why should it care about a 10 to the nine solar mass object sat at its center? Its gravitational sphere of influence is only going to be 10 parsecs or something, 10, 20 parsecs at max. Why should a galaxy many 20, 30 kiloparsecs in size care about this tiny 20 parsec object at its core? That's completely unclear unless this object has helped in its formation. So this is where this idea of galaxy black hole coevolution comes from. So as you want to quench a galaxy, as you want to build up its, 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 um, its bulge and so increase its sigma, you have the black hole play an active part in that. So you, may, you might accrete a galaxy, uh, it adds its stars, it starts to heat up the orbits in this galaxy, increasing sigma, increases its mass. Uh, the black hole then accretes some of that material, grows in mass itself, and blows out that gas. And so you end up with a co-evolution between these properties as galaxies move up the relation that I'm showing this on this graph. That would be the co-evolutionary picture. But that's really hard to study. So if black holes um, are actually the things quenching galaxies, then on this plot, one would expect to see a difference in the mass of the black hole in a galaxy that is currently quenched from one that isn't quenched, because it had to do work in order to quench the object. And by the only way it does work is by swallowing material. And if you look on the graph here, actually, there is such a difference detected in this data. So uh, on this uh, data, the blue points are late type galaxies, spiral galaxies, and the red and green points are early type galaxies. And the red line on this figure is a fit to the early type galaxies and the blue line is a fit to the spirals. And you can see they're offset from one another. But as is clear from the, um, from the error bars on this figure, this difference is not hugely statistically significant. It is significant, but it's, it's not great. But more importantly, you'll notice the symbols are different. So um, for instance, the stars on this diagram are galaxies where they've measured the black hole mass using the stars in the object. The round symbols where they're using the gas and the triangles where they're using um, masers, these um, microwave lasers that are in the accretion disks around supermassive black holes. And what you can notice is that the vast majority of the spiral galaxies uh, had either maser or gas measurements. Because the vast majority of the early type galaxies had stellar measurements. And that should be setting alarm bells ringing for everybody because if you're gonna measure things in a different way and then find an offset, is that systematics or is it real? And so what uh, I, I'm gonna tell you about here is a method that we've sort of been trying to pioneer over the last five, 10 years, uh, to really start to do this with a method that works just as well in both types of galaxies. Uh, so we can really start to address this problem of whether black holes are really implicated in the quenching of these galaxies. So how are black holes usually measured? Well, the really the best way to do this, hopefully you can see this animation. I don't know how well this is gonna work. Oh no, codec unavailable. All right. If the animation worked, you would see that these stars here, these are individual stars in the center of the Milky Way that we can follow with high resolution adaptive optics observations as they orbit around the central black hole in the Milky Way. And that gives us a really precise measurement of the supermassive black hole mass because some of these stars, like the S2 star there, goes very close to the supermassive black hole. So as we can map out its individual orbit, measure the mass enclosed in that orbit, and we can work out there's a dark object there with the position of the star, Sagittarius A star, that has a mass of 10 to the 6 solar masses. That's wonderful, but it's only really possible in the Milky Way because we don't have the resolution to do this anywhere else. So what people typically do instead is they use integrated stellar kinematics. So they take something like an integral field unit. This is the spectrograph where you get a spectrum for every pixel. And you can look at the integrated stellar light along each line of sight. And you can say, okay, how much is the stellar mass for the stars in this galaxy rotating? How much random motion do they have? And that 
you can model that and trace it back to the potential that they live in. So you can look for large spikes in the velocity dispersion, especially as stars rotate faster and faster and faster around the black hole in the center of the object and use those to measure the supermassive black hole mass. So that, as I mentioned before, is only usually possible in early type galaxies. And the resolution that you need to do it is really set by HST at the moment uh, and adaptive optics, which basically reach the same sort of resolution. So that really sets the limit on how far out in the universe we can probe with that method. So an alternative is to use similar sorts of instruments, but actually to look at the ionized gas in the galaxies. So the 10 to the 4K H alpha emitting, let's say, um, ionized gas. So you've got an emission line there that you can, and you can, in the same way, with an integral field unit, measure its emission line kinematics. You see this as an example here of this galaxy where it's, uh, the gas is rotating faster and faster and faster around this central mass, and you see the dispersion is also increasing as you go towards the center of the object. And that lets you measure supermassive black hole mass as well. Uh, you can do that in a wider range of uh, galaxy types because this gas is obviously present in a lot of star-forming spiral galaxies, but uh, it still requires quite complex modeling, and the resolution limit is again set by HST and AO observations. So the, the, other, the other method that people typically use that I mentioned briefly is, is maser observations. They're wonderful uh, because you can get very, very close to the black hole indeed with those with um, VLBI uh, in the radio. You can look at these microwave lasers very close to the supermassive black hole itself. Uh, and you can even measure the black hole mass independent of the distance of the galaxy, which is quite, quite stunning. But these things are very rare, so they're not going to help us grow our samples and really address this question. So I think given my introduction, you can all guess where I'm going with this. Um, what we would like to do is find a tracer that we can use to measure the black hole mass in galaxies of all types. And to allow us to do that, it has to be present at the center of the object and observable at very high angular resolution. And molecular gases, I, I will posit here, is a great tool for that. So it's present in you know, one in four, one in five early type galaxies. And the uh, distribution seems to be fairly uh, unbiased. So it's mostly been brought in by accretion fairly recently. So it traces the full population. And all spirals basically have molecular gas because that's their star forming. It's also a very dynamically cold tracer, as I mentioned. And with ALMA, we can get very high resolution indeed, down to 10 milli arc seconds or even higher, depending on the transition you choose. So that allows us to push much further out in the universe. So it's potentially a very powerful tracer. So uh, in order to press forward with this, um, I started a, a program that's called WISDOM, this millimeter wave interferometric survey of dark object masses, because every good astronomy survey needs an acronym. Uh, and the, the aim of this is really to test this method, to benchmark it, to understand it, and start to pin down the black hole host relations using this new technique that can be used in both types of galaxies. And obviously, we've also then got beautiful maps at 10 parsec resolution of the, uh, of the interstellar medium in a variety of nearby galaxies, which you can do all sorts of science with, which I'll touch on in the second section. So how does it work? So let's take an example here. So this is NGC 383. It's a giant elliptical galaxy. Uh, it's in the field in, in this case. Uh, it's also a 3C radio galaxy. So it, we know it has a large black hole that's spitting out the giant jet actually in this case. Uh, and by looking at it here, you, you might squint and say, oh, that doesn't really look like it should have any molecular gas. But if you zoom into the center with HST, uh, indeed it does. So here we've got an HST and Chandra mosaic. So you can actually see the jet base here in the Chandra blue image uh, jetting out of this object. You see there's this beautiful dust disk in the middle of this object. And that suggests that there should be molecular gas there that we can target uh, to try and estimate the mass of the black hole in this object. So this actually had observations before we uh, targeted it. This is with the Plateau de Beurre interferometer um, in France. And they had about two arc second resolution, so pretty good for the instruments before ALMA. And you see that you've got a nice disk there. This is uh, you know, not many resolution elements, but you can tell there's a nice uh, disk of molecular gas in the center there. So we went out with ALMA and we said, OK, give us really good resolution observations of this. Um, and they said, yes. And this is what they gave us. So it's a beautifully regular disk 
in this object. So this is 0.1 arc second resolution. It's about 40 parsecs, 35 parsecs uh, resolution in this object. And you can see, I mean, when we got this image, we were looking at going, are we sure this isn't a protoplanetary disk that we've just happened to observe wrongly? But no, no, this is a beautifully regular disk here with some overlaid spiral structure. Um, it's beautifully smooth. And if you look at the kinematics, so now I'm showing a velocity field. So blue is blue shifted emission, red is red shifted emission. Um, and you can see it rotates, it rotates very fast. It's a massive galaxy, it's 800 kilometers a second from one side to the other. Um, but the eagle eyed amongst you, so this is uh, all presented in, in North et al. 2019. So the eagle eyed amongst you will have spotted that in the center of this object, the gas is actually rotating faster than its edge. And that's a, a sign that black hole is there, but we can show that a little more clearly if we extract a position velocity diagram. So to do that, we lay down effectively a pseudo slit, uh, for those more used to working in the optical, uh, along the major axis of the galaxy. And you can extract out then from the ALMA data cube, uh, the flux as a function of velocity and position. If you do that, you get this. So a normal galaxy, you would expect to see a rising rotation curve and then it goes flat and that's it. But in this object, instead of dropping to zero in the center, the velocity increases as you go towards the center. And that's because we're seeing the material rotating faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And faster. This is a beautiful detection of the Keplerian rotation around that supermassive black hole. Now, you could, by eye, just look at this and probably more or less read off the black hole mass because there's beautiful capillary in there. Um, but we should be a little bit careful with doing that sort of thing because um, we're using an interferometer. It's not a perfect instrument. You're missing um, zero spacings, for instance. You're missing uh, emission on various scales. And you've got observation effects. You've got a beam. You've got channelization. So you want to model all of those. Um, so yeah, we need to treat that very carefully. Um, so I developed a, a tool for doing this. It's called uh, KineMess, a kinetic molecular simulation tool, but it should actually work for any cold gas distribution you want. Um, it's been used for modeling protocol entry disks, for modeling galaxies like this, all sorts of things. Um, there's now an IDL and a Python version. Um, so they're available at these GitHub links and also to pip install and these type of things. So if you're working with this sort of kinematic data that you'd like to model, um, feel free, download it, try it out, use it. I'm more than happy to, to help people with that. And it's also great for observation planning, putting things uh, either from simulations into observation space or for planning your observations with ALMA. So that's just a little plug for that. So what we can do with that is take our full ALMA data cube uh, and make a forward model of it. So we may use a uh, Bayesian Markov chain Monte Carlo procedure to produce a series of models with all the three parameters and find a best fit for that. And this here, I'm showing you the position velocity diagram that I showed you before. It's, it's identical, just on a smaller scale. Um, overlaid in, that's in orange, and then it's overlaid in blue, the contours from our best fit model. And you can see in this case that we require a 3.4 billion solar mass supermassive black hole at the center of this object. To do this in this object as actually is very easy because the black hole dominates the kinematics in the center of the object. But in principle, at larger out in the galaxy, further out in the galaxy, you've got a dominant contribution from the stellar mass. So to cope with that, we have to model HST images to get that stellar mass distribution and get out um, a mass to light ratio for the galaxy. But all of that is, is covered in the paper there. But you can see we can very, very nicely get a black hole mass for this galaxy. And that black, black hole mass the precision we get on that is competitive with the best measurements made through other techniques. Indeed, we probe a similar mean radius, so the, the emission that we detect at very high velocities here is at a similar position in the accretion disk as the maser emission is, is typically uh, around the accretion disks of the somewhat smaller black holes in terms of the Schwarzschild radius with probing the same sorts of scales. It's also interesting in this object that it seems that the Molecular disk extends from very large radii right the way in to the accretion disk around this material without warping, without being changed by the large jet that this thing is outputting. So 
that's one object, but obviously one object is not that interesting in and of itself. But we can, what we can do is take this and do it on lots of objects. So we've got a, a range of papers. I've put some references there. But you see the, the end result of some of this labor is shown on the left-hand side. So this is, again, the black hole mass sigma relation uh, with the molecular gas measurements from our team and from uh, a couple of other teams who've started to do this. Um, and what you can see is we're able to trace the full range of the M-sigma relation. We've got some very massive galaxies, like the one I was showing you there, um, but also um, some very low-mass galaxies. So we have some dwarf galaxies, which we've been able to do this in, and there's some spiral galaxies as well. So we're able to trace galaxies over the whole range of this M-sigma relation. And we're building up the statistics we need to start to answer the type of questions about what quenching is going on. You'll notice the error bars here are, are much smaller than the typical error bars you saw on the graph before. So our technique is, is pretty precise when it can be applied fully. So that's, that's really, really powerful. So a little conclusion for that section. Why does a supermassive black hole care about the galaxy that it lives in? Well, I can't tell you the full answer yet um, because we're still building up the statistics, but with wisdom and magical gas, I think we, we are on a, a good way to, to answer this question. And if you just do some back of the uh, envelope statistics, so I did this in a paper in 2014, we show that there's about 35,000 galaxies in the SDSS footprint that ALMA could potentially resolve the black hole sphere of influence with. So we're never gonna get time with ALMA to do 35,000, but at least there's a huge target pool out there. And a 10 to the nine solar mass black hole is actually measurable its sphere of influence with ALMA at any redshift. As long as you can get the ancillary observations you need, you can in principle probe the largest black holes right back to the early universe. So that's the conclusions for the first part. And now I'm gonna move on to talk a little bit about the molecular gas in, in these galaxies and why that cares about the, the galaxy that it lives in. So as you all know, spiral galaxies like the Milky Way are actively forming stars. And it seems when we look around us in the Milky Way and also extragalactically that in normal spiral galaxies, they do this with a fairly constant efficiency. They deplete, they, they form stars at a rate that would deplete the gas reservoir in about 2 billion years. So that's shown on the plot on the right hand side here, which is a Kennecott Schmidt diagram, where you plug in the surface density of gas, this is the surface density of star formation on the y axis. And the spiral galaxies and the sort of higher redshift uh, star forming analogs of those, the BZK normal galaxies uh, are shown there, are following that, that black solid line here, which is a basically a constant star formation efficiency with star formation efficiency, at the depletion time of about two giga years, as I mentioned. There are some objects that have higher efficiencies than this, and these are uh, certainly a low redshift emerging galaxies where everything is smashing together uh, and so it makes sense that they may form stars a little bit more efficiently. So we have this picture that normal star formation, when left to do its thing, will form stars uh, with a depletion time of about two gig years. But it turns out that that's not entirely true. Early type galaxies are bucking the trend once more. So as I mentioned earlier, these things are typically thought of as red and dead. But that's not exactly true. So in about a quarter of them, if you look carefully, so in, for instance, in this first image, you would not have guessed that this thing had star formation. But if you zoom in the HST in its core, you see there's this uh, star forming dusty disk right down in the center of this object. So it was properly fueled by a minor merger sometime in the past. So these things, turns out, they don't form stars in the same mode as the spiral galaxies. So in this paper in 2014, I showed this, and it's also been shown by uh, Amelie Santange in the Cold Gas Survey, for instance that the more massive your galaxy, the more bulge dominated your galaxy, uh, they have a lower star formation efficiency. So this uh, plot I'm showing here is the Kennecott schmidt diagram again with the same axis, the surface density of the gas versus the surface density of star formation here measured from far UV and 22 micron emission. Uh, and the red points here are early type galaxies and the black and blue points are spirals and normal starburst galaxies in the local universe, this is the sample of Kennecott 98. And you can see that the red line, which is a fit to the early type galaxies, is offset from this more or less constant depletion time picture, um, typically by a factor of two to three. So these things form stars much less efficiently than they should. 
And that's really weird again. Why would star formation, which we always think of taking place in bound molecular clouds that should have decoupled from their environment, care about galaxy morphology that happens on scales much, much larger than they are? And the only reason that we could come up with at least why this should matter at all is the galaxy potential. It must matter on the cloud scales. So there's been arguments about this morphological quenching arguments um, before, but we wanted to show that, that in detail here. So what we found is that if you take a galaxy, so let's say that this is our galaxy, it's a pure elliptical in this case, it doesn't have to be. Um, if you look at the galaxy, you can work out its rotation curve. So that's what I'm plotting here. This is how it's rotating as a function of radius away from the center of the galaxy. If we were to take a radial cut, it goes from blue shift to one side, red shift to the other, as you would expect from rotation. What we found in this study and in others since is that if the gas is extended in the galaxy, so it extends well past the turnover in the rotation curve, then the star formation efficiency of the entire system comes out in our analysis to be fairly normal. If, however, the gas is really compact compared to the rotation curve, so it, the gas is living in the very center of the object where the bulge is really dominant, and so the rotation is very fast, there's a lot of shear, there's a lot of uh, material whizzing around very quickly in there, uh, then we find a suppressed star formation efficiency. So this little thing is less efficient in forming stars. So you can parameterize that. You can say, okay, what's the peak of my rotation curve? What radius is that at? What radius does my CO extend out to my molecular gas? And you can plot those. So this is what this graph shows. So I'm plotting exactly that ratio on the x-axis versus the depletion time inferred in the gas. And as you can see, if you have gas that is compact, that lives deep within the bulge, then it seems to have much less efficient star formation. Depletion times go up to nearly a Hubble time. Whereas if you are more extended, more regular, you would form stars at a similar rate to no normal nearby star um, spiral galaxies. And that's quite interesting. It also seems that the slope of the rotation curve matters. So what I'm showing here is that depletion time axis again on the y-axis plotted against the mean beta, which is the logarithmic derivative of the rotation curve. It basically tells you how fast the rotation curve is rising. And it seems that this correlates. And that is really quite suggestive of what might be going on in these systems. And that's because if you think back to your basic uh, interstellar medium theory, the stability of a gas disk uh, can be calculated through the classical tomb rate Q parameter, for instance. So that's proportional to, <coughs> excuse me, um, the velocity dispersion of the gas disk itself. So that's the, the random motions, uh, the its surface density. So that's what's pulling down and uh, helping it fragment. And this parameter kappa, which depends on this beta parameter, the derivative of the rotation curve. The stability of a gas against shearing also depends, this here is the aught A constant uh, and the velocity dispersion of the gas again. So this aught A also depends on beta. So this suggests that the steepness of the rotation curve could be implicated in keeping this disk more stable and stopping it forming stars. So what we can do is we can use our wisdom data that gives us beautifully resolved maps of the center of a lot of nearby galaxies to start to address this question. So I'm going to show you some maps now. So here are six of the spiral galaxies we've observed as part of the wisdom program. So what you see is probably what you'd expect from the centers of spiral galaxies. So this is the center, central kiloparsec or two of these objects. You can see lots of spiral arms, spiral features. They're, we're resolving individual giant molecular clouds in a lot of cases in these objects. Uh, and you can see that that's probably what you expect. If you look at the early type galaxies, however, so here's six early type galaxies. With the exception of the one at the bottom right, it struck us that these galaxies look very, very smooth. We have similar resolutions in the two cases. So it's not that we're just not resolving the scales. It really seems that there are no large individual giant molecular clouds in these objects. The molecular clouds are all smaller. So for instance, this galaxy at the top right, the largest 
uh, clump there, the largest giant molecular cloud that we can see there when we look in position, position, velocity space, is about 30 parsecs in size. In the Milky Way, they go up to 100 parsecs in size. So why do they not have large molecular clouds? Well, maybe this is related to this potential. So we can also have a look at this in the dwarf galaxies. So this is an example of, this is the ob one of the objects that I talked about earlier when we measure black hole masses. This is a very nearby dwarf galaxy, and you see 404. Um, so that, that paper is about to, to come out. It's on a second, about to be resubmitted to the referee for a second time. So this, this galaxy looks fairly unremarkable. It doesn't look like it should have a lot of molecular gas. But if you zoom down into its center with HST, you see that indeed it does. There's some dust obscuration in the center. It's been observed before um, with the BEMA uh, interferometer from in the US. And this was published in 2015 as uh, high resolution observations uh, with a second, seven arc second point source. So uh, at about the same time, we were observing this with ALMA uh, and we were much, much better than that. We were 0.03 arc seconds. And this is what we see in the center of this object. So we've got half a parsec resolution here. We can see this beautiful structure that again breaks up into lots of individual, well-resolved in this case, giant molecular clouds in this nearby dwarf galaxy. So this is really suggestive. The things with the biggest bulges, the largest galaxies, have very smooth ISMs, whereas the more disky and lower mass things, everything breaks up. So the gas seems to know about the galaxy that it lives in. We can prove that, so we don't just have to rely on eyeballing the images, we can use the statistics the optical astronomers actually use to classify mergers, for instance, the CAS, concentration asymmetry, smoothness parameters, or Gini and M20, it doesn't really matter what they are. They're all statistics you can run on these sort of images, and they all point to the same result. And that's that the molecular gas in bulge-dominated galaxies is much smoother, less fragmented than the spirals on this sort of 10 to 30 parsec scales. They, the, you can have, extract these clouds and you will find that they have lower velocity dispersion at fixed surface density as well. So maybe these clouds in the, in the early type galaxies cannot be large, they have to be small. So you can have a look at that. You can extract out the individual clouds from a range of galaxies. So paper by Li Li, which is uh, going to come out hopefully very soon, has done this with a thousand GMCs and four objects, but there's, there's many more to come, extracting all these things out. And we find, oh, sorry about the quality of that plot. That didn't come out very well on this large screen. Um, but the GMC properties that we find are quite diverse and they differ strongly from galaxy to galaxy. So the clouds are much smaller than expected given their velocity dispersion, for instance, as you can see on this graph here, it's plotting the size of the cloud versus the velocity dispersion. The black line is the Milky Way Larsen relation. And indeed, it doesn't seem like our clouds follow this in the early type galaxies. You can also extract things like GMC mass functions from these observations, and they vary a lot, even within galaxies. So if you look at different parts of the same galaxy, you find different GMC mass functions. And that seems to vary in a way that depends on the bulge fraction. So for instance, the most massive molecular cloud in each galaxy seems to change as you go from the bulge dominated objects, the spiral galaxies. And that makes sense if there's more fragmentation in those objects. So, the reason we think this happens is shear. As I mentioned before, you can classify the shear uh, from a gas disk as it rotates. If it was in solid body rotation, that would be fine, but it's not, so it's shearing. So this, this part is moving faster than this part. And so the gas in principle will wrap and you'll get spiral features uh, as is, and those spiral features will wrap around as is the classical winding problem in spiral galaxies. Typically, when we think about Larsen's relations, we think about the balance between, uh, in a virialized cloud, that allows you to say what the Larsen's relation should be. You normally neglect shear. And that's normally fine at large radii in galaxies. But as you go towards their centers, deep within the bulges, especially if you've got a very large bulge, you actually shouldn't neglect shear. So for instance, what I'm showing here is the density of the cloud uh, versus the ratio of the size of the cloud to the velocity dispersion in that cloud. As you go up in ORT A, so you get a more and more shear in your rotation curve, 
your clouds cannot hold together. They basically exceed their Roche lobe and they shear apart. So a large cloud has to be very, very dense to survive. Or it gets ripped apart into many small clouds. And so you can see as you increasingly go up in Ort A, you require a denser and denser cloud or a smaller and smaller cloud to survive. And that's exactly what we think is going on in these systems. So I think I've gone slightly over time. So I'll leave it there. So my conclusions for you, uh, molecular gas is a great way of measuring supermassive black hole masses. You can zoom in right around the black hole, really look at the Keplerian motion of that gas around the massive dark objects. And with ALMA, we can really start to revolutionize this field. And what ALMA is also helping us to do with these incredibly high resolution observations is really look at how the morphology of a galaxy, its potential, can change the physics of star formation. So molecular clouds in these objects are feeling the deep potential wells that they're living in, and this is changing star formation properties. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Thank you very much. That's a very good talk. Um, okay, um, I see Gilberto's hand up. So Gilberto, go ahead. Hi. Um, I I would also like you to consider another possibility for the different shapes for the molecular clouds. Uh, if you don't assume that the clouds are st static structures isolated from the environment, then they are going to be affected by that environment. For example, Omar, specifically, if you consider how long, what's the size of the ISM you need to gather together to form a cloud of a given size, then if you have a lot of shear, you're not going to be able to form a large cloud. Yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense. Uh, that's my, my comment. Yeah, I, I think that, that makes total sense. I think you know the, the paper that Ligier is writing on this is, is going through a lot of these different possibilities. And it seems that, that shear is an important one and whether or not that's on the individual cloud scale or from a larger uh, smooth disk and how it can then assemble and fragment. I think these are all parts of the same picture. Yeah. Brilliant. Rosa, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Very nice and interesting talk. Um, I have a question about your first half. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we know that the EHT measured for M87 a mass that coincides with a previous measurement from stellar dynamics and does not coincide with a previous measurement from gas dynamics. So if this were, were the case for all galaxies, that would help um, close the gap or the offset between spirals and ellipticals. So um, with your or molecular um, gas measurements, do they coincide with either or both when you have different kinds of measurements for a same galaxy? Yeah, so we have been trying to do exactly this to get objects where we already know the black hole from another measurement. Mm -hmm. What we're finding at the moment is that typically um, they agree pretty well. Um, we, so there certainly have been cases where there's ionized gas upper limits and we actually find a larger black hole mass. Um, and that's typically because the assumptions that are often made in the ionized gas modeling, especially when only, say, cis individual spectra with one position angle were available, mm -hmm. the assumptions made in those, some of those cases may not have been the best in the end. Mm -hmm. So I think there is definitely some selection effects. Interestingly, for M87, that has a tiny disk of molecular gas around the black hole. And it's been an aim of ours to try and use that to estimate the mass for a long time. Mm -hmm. Alma has observed this several times to try and do this, but it's really, really difficult because you've got such a bright jet there that it completely blows out your dynamic range and everything else gets incredibly hard. Um, but it's something that the Alma staff are actively working on with, with some of us to, to try and get that really pinned down so we can say, okay, what does molecular gas say about that black hole? Hopefully it agrees with the EHC, but we don't know yet. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Rosa. Uh, Roberto? Uh, yes, I think. Um, so, uh, you know, there are these results um, 
published mainly by people like Steve Longmore, etc., that show that the the gas around the galactic center in the CMC is uh, inefficient uh, forming stars. Do you think that your explanation that you're finding for ellipticals uh, applies there too? Yeah, so th this was certainly, you know, we've always, you know, I've, I've talked with Steve a lot about this and I think, you know, it's also something that they've considered um, in their case, looking at shear and they, they've certainly put it forward before as a potential. I think they are now coming down, I think the last papers I read on this, coming down more on a stochasticity argument. Um, but I think it's still an open question wh whether what we see in these extragalactic environments is the same as what's happening in the Milky Way, um, where you've got that strong bar and things are quite stochastic in terms of gas inflow. Um, it's potentially, it could be an important or it could be an, a different effect entirely. Thanks, Roberto. Uh, Enrique? Okay. Hi. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if you could show again, please, the, uh, the figure where you have the Larson relation for the different types of clouds. Yeah, uh, uh, this yeah. one, this, this one, exactly. And because you were precisely mentioning, I, I wanted to see which types of clouds lie higher in this plot. I, I, I sort of missed that. Uh, and then to see if it, if it fits with what we've been arguing ourselves concerning molecular clouds in general. So mm -hmm. which are the ones that are higher? Uh, so, so the highest point here is actually the Milky Way center clouds. Mm -hmm. So that's the dashed brownish line here. Mm -hmm. um, so then uh, the things at the set, so the, the things, so there's, some various external galaxies here. So the more spirally ones are nearer to the, uh, to the Larson laws for the Milky Way. And the early type galaxies are, are tend to be higher up with uh, mm -hmm. smaller sizes than expected given their velocity dispersion. The early types are higher, right? Yes. So, uh, and what can we say? Because uh, you showed an interesting plot, which is the, what we call the Larson ratio. So the velocity dispersion to the size to the one half power and uh, versus volume density. Uh, what is quite typical is to plot this versus surface density. And uh, generally higher uh, column density objects lie higher, well, lie above. So there's a similar inclined line and higher column densities also correspond to higher values of the Larson ratio. So how do these clouds that you plotted in the previous plot uh, fit in a Larson ratio versus column density plot? Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I've made this plot. I'm now trying to remember off the top of my head uh, exactly where they fall. So th th there's a scatter. I think there are some clouds that definitely seem to be unbound if you would follow this. Uh, so with you know, the, yeah, the, uh, these high ratios that you expect. Um, okay. There are some below as well. But. Yeah, because our standard understanding of these things, but I, I totally, uh, I have to totally admit that we've never worried about uh, clouds near galactic centers. So we're, we always talk about clouds uh, in, in solar neighborhood type of environments. And, but um, in that case, it is just a signature of uh, equipartition between gravita gravitational energy and kinetic energy. We prefer to think that the clouds are falling, infalling than being in very low equilibrium, but that's a so sort of separate object matter. But uh, what I was wondering is in that, in that type of clouds, and that goes all the way from GMCs to um, massive star forming clumps of very much higher column densities, they all line up in a single uh, uh, energy equipartition line, more or less, with a scatter of a factor of several, maybe. So I wonder, but it is true that if you have an, a, an important uh, shearing or centrifugal component that might throw galactic center type of clouds off that uh, trend. So that was my question, whether, uh, whether the, for example, uh, galactic center type of clouds would fall uh, in a different line than, for example, uh, Mil uh, Milky Way uh, solar neighborhood type of clouds. Have you ever looked at that? Yeah, so, so indeed they do. So the, 
the, especially the ones nearest the centers of our objects are the ones that are typically the most extreme and they, they, they fall well above the, the relation of the typical Milky Way clouds on that. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions? You can still raise your hand. We have a few minutes. A few minutes. Ah, uh, Rosa, again. Uh, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. Just just a comment that uh, for now, almost, I don't know, more than 30 years, it has been known that early type galaxies have a lot of molecular gas. That there's an old paper, I think it's Young and Knesek at the end of the 80s. And they have a lot, a lot of molecular gas, but they don't make stars. And um, I think that shear had already been proposed, although I don't know how, how deeply this, ha this had been analyzed. But um, it's, it's very nice that now you, you team can see directly the, the little gas disks. Yeah, I yeah, completely agree. Yeah, this, is, this is not a new field. I always what, what I find, I did my PhD on molecular gas in early type galaxies, and mm -hmm. I would always get people say, there's molecular gas in early type galaxies, so I'm always uh, keen to present it, to tell people that there is, but it's great that other people, that, that message is getting through, and people are recognizing the work since, as you say, the 70s, 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, Javier. So, um, I was wondering, uh, in this plot that you are showing right now, uh, exactly, I didn't get exactly what is the, the meaning of this, of this curve, uh, 40, 400, and 4,000 uh, Earth A things. So can you, can you explain sure. that? Sure. Sorry, yeah, I, I realized I was uh, running quite a bit over, over the time I'd expected, so I went over it a little fast. So, so the idea here is that in this space, um, a galaxy that lies below, so let's take the dashed line to start with that goes diagonally across the plot. That is the line that you would get from using Larson's laws, so the typical uh, things for a cloud in virial equilibrium in, the, in a, uh, a flat, in a normal rotation curve where the orth constant is, is very low, so shear is very unimportant. So a cloud below that line, so the bottom half of the diagram would be bound or collapsing. And above that line, it is unbound, so it, can, it cannot collapse, it has to disperse. So we find typically that things lie around the line or slightly below it, hopefully, if they're gonna form some stars. If, however, you add shear into the equation, uh, which is parameterized by this A coefficient, so the larger that is, the more shear you've got, then you start forbidding parts of this parameter space. So if your shear were to be 400, let's say, then everything to the left of that 400 line that was bound previously, if you were in a less shearing environment, is suddenly unbound as well. So a cloud that did used to lie on the left here is now completely unbound. You have to lie at the right-hand side to still be bound. So you, you progressively cut out pieces of this parameter space where you can no longer have bound clouds. That a little clearer? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. We have maybe one more question. Okay, if not, then let's uh, thank Tim again. Thanks, Thanks everyone for having me. Yeah, we had lots of interesting questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm.